Come join me on my second channel, Jaguar Gator 8, where we'll talk all things college football. New video drops every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch the latest video. And now, on with our feature presentation. Think of when a head coach should go into a press conference and say that his quarterback needs to improve and isn't playing as well as you'd hope. Odds are, when you think of a scenario where this would happen, and where a head coach would put his quarterback on blast in public for the whole world to see, it's usually a scenario where a quarterback has a really bad game that costs his team the win, and a scenario where the coach is trying to light a fire under the quarterback to let him know that if he doesn't prepare better, or doesn't play better, that he can be replaced, and that his job is on the line. We've seen coaches do this many times before, where they tell a quarterback that he's not where he needs to be, he's missing guys, and that he needs to step it up, because his play right now is unacceptable. In other words, it doesn't come after literally the best game of said quarterback's career. This is New York Giants head coach Alex Webster. In his very first season as the head coach of the Giants, he decided to have the genius idea to put his quarterback, Fran Tarkenton, on blast, and he spent an entire press conference criticizing him and saying all the things he needs to improve upon. Except when you realize what exactly he said when he said those comments, specifically the fact that he said them at literally the weirdest possible time, you get a truly bizarre situation that more than half a century later, I'm still not sure I quite understand. This is the story behind the strangest moment of the illustrious Hall of Fame career of the legendary Fran Tarkenton. Before I talk about the bizarre incident in question and the comments made by head coach Alex Webster that left everyone scratching their heads, we need some context to understand the importance of this game, as well as how the Giants were doing. Because when you break down the offseason that they had in 1969, some parts of the story and maybe inexperience on Webster's part begin to make a bit of sense. Entering the 1969 season, the head coach of the New York Giants was not Alex Webster. In fact, it was this man right here, Ali Sherman. I'm not going to dive too much into the weeds of this, because that's a story for another time. But by the time the 1969 preseason ended, Sherman had completely lost the team. The Giants had five straight seasons without a winning record, and the decision to give Sherman a 10-year mega deal was looking like a horrible investment with each passing day. The Giants had an abysmal preseason when they went 0-5, including an embarrassing 37-14 loss at the hands of the New York Jets in the rival American Football League. And this was back when preseason results meant something in the eyes of coaches and executives. Sherman was controlling the team like a lunatic, to the point where the team was holding private meetings without Sherman in the room. They hated him that much. Even Fran Tarkenton, the team's quarterback who joined in 1967, was fed up and refused to disclose what took place behind closed doors, saying, What happened in there is no one else's business but the team's. It was strictly for us and among us. However, it was later revealed what was said during the final meeting after that last preseason loss to the Steelers, and it was revealed that Tarkenton basically told the team to go rogue and do whatever they wanted to, because they were playing for each other and not Sherman. As Tarkenton said, We're going to do things our own way. You want to go out and relax a little? Go ahead. Do anything you want. Anything. From now on, you will be marked only by what you produce on the field every Sunday as professional football players. This chaos and dysfunction was enough for the Giants and Oda Wellington Mara to finally cut ties with Sherman, with the ship having all but sunk at this point. As a side note, to learn more about the career of Ali Sherman, and the moment everything really started to fall apart past the point of no return, click the card in the upper right corner. Less than a week before the regular season was set to start, the Giants hired this man right here to be their new head coach. This is Alex Webster, and he was somewhat of a Giants legend as a player, having played 10 seasons for the team from 1955 to 64, and having made it to the Pro Bowl twice, making it in 1958 and 1961. He helped the Giants win the NFL Championship in 1956, which was their most recent title at the time, by scoring two touchdowns in their 47-7 victory over the Chicago Bears and he led the Giants to six NFL Championship appearances in his ten seasons as a player. Not too shabby. But his coaching experience was quite minimal. He was the backfield coach of the Giants for the past two seasons before becoming the new head coach after Sherman's departure. And that was it. That was all he brought to the table. He had no time to bring in his guys or implement his system, which is important to understand when we realize what he says later on in the crux of our story. But after a one-on-one -on -one start through two games, up next for Webster was guiding his team to a victory against the same team that he beat in that 1956 NFL Championship. And little did anyone in attendance at Yankee Stadium that day know just how good this game was going to be. October 5th, 1969. 
We're at Yankee Stadium for this week three matchup between the Giants and the Bears on a beautiful 55 degree fall day in New York. And this is a pretty big game for the Giants as they look to defend their home field. Remember that back in 1969, only the division winners made it into the postseason, as there was no wild card. So far in the Century Division, every team looked like they had a shot, with not a whole lot separating anyone. The Browns were in front at 2 0, with the Cardinals and Steelers tied with the Giants at 1 1. The last thing you want to do in a race like this where you have to win is to fall behind, especially when you're playing a Bears team that is widely regarded as one of the worst in all of football. And the Giants knew that if they were going to win this game, they were going to need to have a great performance out of this man right here. Tarkenton was a star in New York, making it to the Pro Bowl in back-to-back -back seasons. However, his start to 1969 was inconsistent to say the least. In the team's shocking 24-23 upset victory over the Minnesota Vikings, he played great, throwing three touchdown passes and no interceptions while posting a passer rating of 105.5. In the team's shutout 24-0 loss to the Detroit Lions, however, he played not so great, going just 5-16 for 16 for a completion percentage of just over 31%. The Giants would only go as far as Tarkenton would take them, so if they wanted to be above 500 after Week 3, then he would need to show up. As for how this game played out, Fran Tarkenton didn't just show up. He had one of the best games of his career. In fact, you could make the argument that at the time, this was the best game of his entire career. In the first quarter, Tarkenton got things going right away with a 42-yard touchdown pass to Don Herman to give the Giants a 7-0 lead. He followed that up with another touchdown in the first quarter, with this one going to Freeman White from 23 yards out. By the time halftime hit, the Giants were up 21-14, with Tarkenton throwing a third touchdown pass in the second quarter, as he hit Don Herman yet again from 17 yards out. Not a bad game for the rookie wide receiver taken out of Waynesburg in the 15th round of the NFL Draft. And even though the Bears had a 24-21 lead late in the fourth quarter, hitting the go-ahead field goal from 25 yards out with 2.38 left in the contest, Tarkenton had plenty of time to march his troops down the field and pull off some last-minute dramatics. With 59 seconds left in the game, Tarkenton hit legendary giant running back Joe Morrison from 28 yards out to give New York a 28-24 lead, which they would eventually win the game by that point. By the time the final gun sounded, Tarkenton's numbers were superb, as he was the clear-cut MVP of the game. He finished the game with 227 yards passing, 4 touchdowns, no interceptions, and a passer rating of 126.2. This game was not only great by the incredibly high standards of Tarkenton, who was at that point a 4-time Pro Bowl quarterback, but was great by NFL standards, period. Let's start with how this game compared to his career. The four touchdowns tied a career high for most touchdowns he ever threw in a game, and it was the first time in a start that he ever had a game with four touchdowns and no interceptions. Although I should note that in 1961, he had a game off of the bench, coincidentally against the Chicago Bears, where he threw four touchdowns and no picks. He threw 25 passes and finished the game with a passer rating of 126.2. It was just the second time in his career that he had a passer rating of 125 when throwing at least 25 passes as the other time came in a 1965 game against the San Francisco 49ers, where he threw 35 passes and had a passer rating of 129.1 in a 42-41 victory while he was with the Vikings. And from the NFL perspective, in 1968, the year before this, there were only three instances over the course of the entire season in both the NFL and the AFL of a quarterback throwing four touchdowns and no interceptions in a game. There were 182 games played, meaning a minimum of 364 quarterbacks could have done this in a start, and it only happened three times, which comes out to 0.8% of the time. Which is why I think it goes without saying that Tarkenton played out of his mind in this game. Throwing four touchdowns, no interceptions, winning the game, and hosting a pass rating of 126.2 is an incredible game by 2022 standards. By 1969 standards, just like Neil Armstrong's landing on the moon a few months before, it was out of this world. So after the game, you would think that Webster would have some words of encouragement and praise for Tarkenton, right? Prepare yourself for a truly bizarre moment that more than half a century later still does not make any sense whatsoever. Now before I go any further, I have to note that after the game, Webster had praise for other players on the team. He was incredibly proud of Joe Morrison, especially after he scored that game-winning touchdown. As Webster said on Morrison, he has done so much for the Giants for many years. And he praised wide receiver Homer Jones, who was two years removed from leading the league with 13 touchdowns, but had a quiet game against the Bears with just one catch. Webster loved Jones' attitude, saying that he realized his role on the team 
that he didn't have to catch 100 passes to help the club, and that he was taking on his role as a decoy incredibly well, as even though he was suffering a bit from an individual stat line perspective, he was helping the team out tremendously. So it was not as though Webster blasted everyone. In fact, it was quite the opposite. That was everyone except Grant Tarkenton. Because after the game, when Webster met with reporters, he talked about the play of his quarterback. Think of all the things a coach would usually say in that situation. They would say something like, he played really well today. Or, I'm proud of how he stayed calm on that final drive. Or, that was one of the best games I've seen him play, and I've seen him play a lot of great games. Not Alex Webster. Because amazingly enough, that game was not good enough for him. He was not kidding. He was not being sarcastic. He was not joking. And he was not celebrating April Fool's Day six months late on the first week in October. He legitimately took the time at the press conference to rip on his quarterback. As Webster said, he's still not at the point where I'd like him to be. His timing has been off. He's had trouble finding his receivers. I'd like him to throw it away more. It's a hard thing to get a quarterback to do. I'm sorry. What? I know you're new to this whole coaching thing, having been thrust into almost an impossible spot, and I know Tarkenton isn't a guy that you handpicked. But are you kidding me? The man just threw four touchdowns and no interceptions in a winning effort. And not only do you not have anything nice to say about him, but you're criticizing the way that he plays the game, and you say that he's not playing up to your standards? If you heard that quote completely out of context, you probably think that the quarterback he was talking about was bad, and was coming off of a shutout loss or a game where they didn't score a touchdown. You never think that this was about a Pro Bowl quarterback who made it to the Pro Bowl literally every season he was with the Giants at the time coming off of a four-touchdown performance in a win. Nothing about this moment makes any sense. I'm going to take you to the movies for a second to illustrate just how stupid and how ridiculous this whole situation was. Let's talk about the movie Whiplash for a second. I'm not going to spoil anything, but after this video, if you have not seen the movie Whiplash, you need to see it ASAP, because it might be my favorite movie of all time, and it's one of the greatest movies ever made. Anyways, there's a scene in the movie where one of the main characters, Fletcher, is talking about how people aren't striving for greatness and are too scared to tell the truth and push people to be great. During this scene, he delivers one of my all-time favorite lines in a movie. There are no two words in the English language more harmful than good job. And to an extent, he's completely on the money. The phrase good job can be dangerous if the person in question didn't do a good job. It allows people to be complacent, to get a false sense of security, to get a false sense of their skill, to develop an ego that is not justified, and to not strive to do better things. However, in the context that the line was said, it was because the person Fletcher was talking about did not do a good job playing. He didn't say that saying this phrase was dangerous after a person actually does a good job. He just means it in the sense that praise when it's not warranted is harmful. I know the movie wasn't out in 1969, but here, it's like Alex Webster saw the movie, took this quote, and got the completely wrong meaning out of it, and believed that he should never tell anyone that they did a good job. Here you had a quarterback who won you the game, who threw four touchdown passes and no interceptions, and who had a game that was exceptional not just by his standards, but by the standards of the National Football League, and ranked statistically as one of the best games by any quarterback of the year and even the decade. And you're out here telling him that he did not do a good job? You have the audacity to publicly criticize Fran Tarkenton and tell the world that he did not meet your standards and that he wasn't playing the game at your tempo? I can't tell you whether or not he was rushing or dragging because the man had the best game of his Hall of Fame career. It would be one thing if Tarkenton didn't have a great game, but to bash a guy after a historically great performance like that and in a winning effort nonetheless just makes no logical sense whatsoever. Tarkenton and Webster didn't exactly have the best relationship, with things getting so heated that at one point in 1971, which was Tarkenton's final season with the Giants, Tarkenton walked out of camp without even so much as saying goodbye to Webster. And maybe the first crack in that relationship came one month into Webster's head coaching duties, when he bashed Tarkenton for no reason whatsoever. I guess the lesson here for any coach is that you have to pick your battles wisely. There was definitely an appropriate time and place to go public and bash a player for his performance. There was definitely a time where you can use the press to your advantage to light a fire under a guy. Doing it after a guy won the game and had the best game of his entire NFL career at that point is literally the worst possible time imaginable. Because when you say that a guy needs to be better, even though it's almost physically impossible to play any better and to play at a higher level than he already is, just makes no sense from any angle. 
It doesn't make sense from a competitive angle. It doesn't make sense from a psychological angle. It doesn't make sense from a relationship and team chemistry angle. You get the idea. It just doesn't make sense no matter how you slice it. Fran Tarkenton played in 246 games over his illustrious Hall of Fame career, and played in 257 if you count the playoffs. And in a truly strange and inexplicable moment, perhaps the best game he ever played was the one he was criticized for the most afterwards. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to JaguarGator8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.